Hello everyone, my name is Bill Rand and I'll be talking to you today about simulating macro level effects uh, from micro level observations. Uh, this is a paper that I co-wrote with Ned Smith who is at Northwestern University uh, and it is uh, to appear in Management Science. It's uh, currently winding its way through the final stages of the publishing process. Um, so this paper is I thought would be very appropriate for this conference because it's really about um, kind of methodologies of agent-based modeling and how to improve uh, the methodologies that we're using. So let's start from the other perspective. So lab experiments, uh, which are commonly used in psychology, management science, sociology, right, are very useful for identifying and illuminating mechanisms which drive people to make particular decisions. Um, they can help us to explore decision-making theories and observations of individual behavior, but the problem is they're not generalizable, right? If you set up a very controlled lab experiment, which is great because you can remove a lot of the unnecessary, extraneous, potential other confounding factors that are in it, um, it's not clear how many actual real world decisions that particular lab experiment applies to. So what can we do with a lab experiment result to tell or to discuss what would happen if everyone operated by that result outside of the lab? Right? So one approach would be to combine it with agent-based modeling because we know that agent-based modeling is useful for demonstrating how complex social phenomena can emerge from individuals who learn, adapt, interact, and behave according to specific and idiosyncratic decision rules. Now, part of the problem with that statement, part of the problem with agent-based modeling in general, is where do you get the decision rules? Um, there are traditionally kind of two approaches to this. One we might call the top-down approach, right? And then the top-down approach what you're doing is you're pointing to a macro level empirical observation and asking, can I generate a set of rules that will grow that macro level observation, right? Um, you know, this is the kind of classic example of this is what Tom Schelling did back in the 1970s, right? When he basically came up with these, he saw segregated patterns of living around the world around him in terms of where people decided to reside. And he came up with a rule that made a decision about how people should decide to live in a particular place. Um, and he showed that even with a small bias um, for someone who is similar to you, that all of a sudden you get these massively segregated patterns of residential location decision making, right? Um, and you know, I, I had a chance to chat with Shelley actually just before he died um, and did a series of interviews with him, which by the way are also available on this YouTube channel. And, Schelling uh, mentioned that, you know, he did not come up with these rules from theory necessarily. He came up with the rules by just talking to his friends and coworkers and seeing how they made residents. In other words, the, the decision rule was not grounded in a lab experiment or something along those lines, right? It was, it was grounded in his observations um, of, of, of other human behavior. So another approach to be doing agent-based modeling would be a bottom-up approach, right? You could start with the decision-making theories and then say what happens when you aggregate these theories? Does it create patterns of behavior that we see in the real world, right? Um, and in this paper, we're gonna argue primarily for this latter approach. It's not to say that the top-down approach is wrong or incorrect, it's just a different way of, uh, of deciding how to construct your agent-based model. So, we emphasize in, 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 in this talk four major aspects of the benefits of combining lab experiments and major based models. One would be that it allows you to analyze the macro implications of micro level findings. You know, this is the old question, what happens if everyone behaves like X, right? If you find a particular lab result, right, what happens if everyone uses that lab result? You know, and, and how, what would happen as a result of that? Another thing you can do is you can take a lab finding and examine the sensitivity of that finding to factors not easily observed or manipulated in the lab, right? So are there environmental variables that you can't really manipulate easily in the lab, such as, you know, um, in, in the shelling case, right, if you were to redo that as a lab experiment, right? Um, you can't really redo all the different, like, amenities that particular houses might have very easily, right? So maybe you could build a more complex model of residential purchase decision making in a simulation. You can also develop additional theory, right? You can see if the lab creates questions that you could go back and then 
uh, test in the simulation and then go and then based upon those simulations see what the results are and then see if you need to go back and create new lab results right so you can do this back and forth from lab to simulation to simulation to lab generating new theory along the way finally you know you can do interventions right in a in a in a simulation right you can build your simulation if it seems to be well grounded you can then try things that might manipulate the result and then can use the results to proceed with real world experiments because real world experiments are costly right and so we need to figure out which ones are most likely to succeed before we carry them out um, so we're going to explore these four ideas within the concept of a particular paper a particular lab experiment and this was done by my co-author and some of his colleagues um, and, and, and their lab experiment, what they did was they looked at what would happen when you impose a job loss threat on an individual. How does that affect their social network, right? And specifically, how did they search their social network as a result of a perceived job loss threat, right? Um, and what they found was that people behaved very differently, right? Lower socioeconomic status individuals tended to collapse and focus on their friends and family uh, when perceiving a job loss threat. And higher socioeconomic status people tended to expand their social network and contact all the friends that they could possibly knew about and friends of friends and so forth, um, kind of following the old uh, adage of looking at weak ties to really look for their next job, right? Um, and that was a very different result, but you know, it's really hard to go from that result to saying something about jobs in general, right? Like, what does that mean for job patterning in society, right? And so we wanted to build an agent-based model to explore that. So in our model, all agents are assigned an initial amount of wealth and an initial earning rate at random drawn from a normal distribution. And so the wealth distribution, you can think of it this way, is fairly normal, right? And this is unlike what we tend to see in actual real wealth distributions, but we did this on purpose, right? We want to start with a world that is equal and see if um, it generate, we can generate a world that is unequal from that world. So one other note, all agents are placed at random in a network where the connections, the strength of ties, follows a power law distribution, I, you know, it is a preferential attachment network. This, of course, is known to represent many real world networks where a few nodes, a few people have lots and lots of friends and a lot of people have very few friends. At each time step, agents earn wealth according to their earning rate, right? Um, and every time step, one tenth of the agents become unemployed. We just we we make it this we set their earning rate to zero, right? And so there is once they're unemployed, they're searching out for a new job. And to find a new job, those with a wealth over a given threshold find the neighbor of their neighbor with the maximum wealth and create a link to that node, i.e. they get hired, right? They are now working for the individual. Um, this could be called network widening among the high status. It's getting a new job via weak ties, right? On the other hand, individuals who are um, lower in socioeconomic status in terms of their wealth in this particular case, they actually collapse their network in terms of they don't really search very much. They just find their friend who has their highest tie and take their job. So here's what the network, network sorry, the model actually looks like. This is in, uh, written in NetLogo, as you can see, uh, and you can see the preferential attachment network there. Um, and we, you know, we just have these four parameters, the number of individuals, the uh, K, which is the controlling factor for a preferential attachment network, the minimal number of network connections any node has, the unemployment rate per turn, and wealth alpha, which basically just controls um, how far above or below the median that you have to be to be considered low or high socioeconomic status. So when we run this model for many, many simulations, right, over thousands of runs, um, with those kind of base parameters set the way they were in that description, we get a, a bimodal wealth distribution, right? So this is more similar to what we see empirically, right? Uh, there's a growing disparity in wealth, growing wealth-based disparity in social connectedness. By the way, we also see that this also happens in the social network, right? Where a uh, few individuals have more and more links over time and a lot of individuals have fewer and fewer links. Um, now, we are not arguing, by the way, that network response, winnowing or widening your social network completely explains all of, of, of wealth disparities in the, United, in the United States or the industrialized world for that matter, right? What we are just arguing is that by running it this way, we are showing that it is at least a sufficient condition for producing such disparities over a long run.
right? Um, so this is potentially an explanatory factor in what's going on. And so here, we're essentially filling out that first step of what we argued for the benefits of these two systems uh, together, the lab experiment and the agent-based model, by showing that if everyone behaved the way the lab experiment shows off, that that would create this wealth disparity, right? Okay, so now let's switch to sensitivity analysis. So, as we said, one of the things we can do with a, a simulation is we can explore how robust our results are to particular changes in the setups. And when you're trying to identify what parameters to analyze in terms of sensitivity analysis, we provide four criteria. One is that you should analyze any parameter that you think of as, that you're not certain about, right? That you don't have a strong reason to feel that parameter should be set that way. Right? And this basically applies to most of the parameters because really, you know, when you're doing all the scaling and remapping from a real world environment to a model, you're going to you're going to introduce some uncertainty. But in general, the more uncertain you are in the parameter, the more likely it is that you should run a sensitivity analysis on it. Another parameter you might want to change is parameters that are an environmental dynamic, right? Obviously the the job world is not the same every single place in the world, right? Like the, the market is for jobs is different in North Carolina than it is in Illinois, right? And it could be different, and it's going to be different in the United States than it is in India, right? So you may want to look at parameters that could affect those results to see if um, how they affect those results, right? Um, so in our case, right, we're thinking about things like the unemployment rate, right? Um, if you feel that a parameter is model altering, in other words, it changes things in a dramatic way, right, above and beyond just a linear input, then that's obviously something you should check for how sensitive the model results are. And then finally, and we're going to um, we're going to save this for the interventions discussion, but obviously you should think about which parameters are controlling parameters, right? That they there are parameters that you actually have control over. Um, as, as a whole, you don't have a lot of control, like as a policymaker in a local town, you don't have a lot of control over the unemployment rate, but you can take actions to affect it, right? Uh, but there might be other things like educating unemployed individuals that you do have control over. And so uh, that's something that you might want to favor in your analysis. So let's take a look at one of these. So let's talk about uh, manipulating an uncertain parameter. So one uncertain parameter that was in our initial model is the exact network density, right? We um, use the synthetic network, and so you know it could be that maybe um, real-world networks have a different density level than what we originally simulated our results with, right? So what we did was we just varied the density, right? And then we had to look at some measure, we had to choose a measure that would be an indicator of the sense, overall sensitivity of our model. And one of the things that's really important for us was looking at how unequal the wealth distribution was in the network. And one way to look at that would be to use the Gini coefficient, which is a traditional measure of wealth inequality, right? And so what we did was we just measured the Gini coefficient of that distribution, right, um, over a variety of different network densities. Um, and one on the Gini coefficient is maximum inequality, by the way, just to remind you, and zero equals maximum equality, right? And so what you can see over many, many runs is that the network density does not have a dramatic effect on the wealth inequality, right? Um, so the model does not seem to be sensitive to the initial distribution of social ties. Another one that I mentioned that we might want to check out is unemployment rates, since that could vary over time and space, right? Um, and what we found is that when you increase the unemployment rate, that also increases the, uh, the, uh, the inequality in the network, right? Um, higher rates of unemployment or more economic turmoil increases overall wealth disparity. This is interesting because there's been some argument in the past that recessions are equalizers when it comes to wealth, to employment generated wealth. But in fact, what we find is that um, though the result is leveling off at a 50% unemployment rate, which is really high, it does overall increase the wealth disparity. In other words, people uh, who are well off continue to do well off, better well off in a recession type environment. Um, so one, you know, one thing that might affect the model results that we don't really know a lot about is what is the definition for a higher low socioeconomic status individual, right? Um, so we modified this well originally we said it that a high socioeconomic status individual is someone who is one standard deviation above the mean wealth. And then we looked at two standard deviations, three, four, or five, right? And what we find that's interesting is that the inequality in the network actually goes down the, the 
smaller the fraction of uh, socio of high socioeconomic status individuals there are, right? Um, and this makes sense somewhat, right? Because basically it means everyone is similar to each other. Now, unfortunately, we did some further dives, and what we find is that the, what results is that there's just a lot more poor people, right? Which is not necessarily what you want. Um, and so the world is much more similar because everyone's really poor. Okay. So that's an example of sensitivity analysis, something that you can't really do in a lab experiment, but you could explore in, in simulation. Finally, let's talk about new theory, right? So in our original results and in the original lab, right, people are presented with this quandary about, um, about how to search for a job, right? In our model, we're kind of force feeding them to either use the low socioeconomic status individual solution or the high socioeconomic status individual. But what if people actually had to learn this, right? That it wasn't something they were given to, right? Um, and so one question is, do people actually learn uh, brokerage and learn how to search out or do they abandon it, right? Are they given the higher socioeconomic status policy and then move away from it? So we built a system in which new agents, um, all unemployed agents initially get a job from their closest tie, but with a very low probability unemployed agents at random take a chance at brokerage, right? If the brokerage scenario, um, in the brokerage scenario, the probability of getting a job, I should say, is contingent now on the wealth disparity between the job seeker and the job hire, right? So the idea is that now there's some probability that they're not going to get a job, and that probability is dependent upon how unequal they are. And this, we felt like, was a fairly realistic assumption. It's hard to move from being you know, a uh, fast food uh, cash register attendant to being C a CEO of GM, right, or something like that. Um, and so the more, the, the greater the disparity in wealth, the less likely you are to get the job. What we had was a rule that says that if an unemployed agent is unsuccessful using brokerage, he or she is increasingly likely to turn inwards um, looking for a new job from a neighbor. This is kind of the fear of, um, of uh, failure, right? That if I keep going out and sticking my neck out and I keep getting told, no, you don't get a job, I'm less likely to use that approach in the future. However, you know, we made it so that friends are 100% likely to give you a job. And so in that scenario, right, people start to turn inwards. Um, and we tried several different variations on this experiment, but in the end, what we found is that there seems to be um, uh, that a natural preference for network density, in other words, a natural preference for people to search their friends, their close friends, and a, and a necessity of learning brokerage um, seems like a more plausible mechanism than the opposite. Okay. Finally, we wanted to look at interventions, right? So this is a new, this is something you also can't try out very well in the lab. So what we did was we basically added a rule that said, what if you increase the probability of someone using um, brokerage, of, of, of searching their whole network uh, by educating them, right? So people come in to an unemployment center uh, looking for a job, and they're taught that, hey, have you thought about reaching out to your friends of your friends, right? And that's kind of a simple idea, but it has to be fleshed out. So, you know, in our scenario, in the simulation, that's easy to manipulate. We just said, hey, um, you know, even though you are below the socioeconomic status that would normally search your whole network, we're going to give a bump to you by educating you about it. And what we find is that um, the mean wealth of the network actually goes up. Now, interestingly enough, the wealth disparity remains, right? Uh, because essentially, the rich, wherever who happen to be there, wherever they are, are going to continue to get richer at an equal or faster rate because they're using the exact same mechanisms uh, to gain their new jobs that the poor people are. But overall, the network does better, right? People, there's a there's an increase in absolute wealth even if there's no decrease in wealth disparity. So we wanted to, I just want to end with a couple of recommendations. ABM researchers should really look toward experimental research and social and organizational psychology to ground their work. Experimental researchers, on the other hand, should consider what the long-run and scaled-up implications of their work are. And we feel that simulation uh, should be considered a vital part of the validation process of a lot of research, and vice versa, right? If you want to prove that your agent-based model is valid, one way you could do that is by looking for lab experiments to back up the results. Um, 
I, ideally, we'd like to see a merger of these two methodological fields, right? Experimental methods should be taught to computational researchers and computational methods taught to traditional experimental fields. Okay, and with that, I'll end. Um, if you have any questions, the full paper, the preprint, is up at go.ncsu.edu slash labavm. You can email me at wmrand at ncsu.edu. I'm also available on Twitter at Bill Rand, and I, my, all my YouTube videos are uh, available at youtube.com slash Bill Rand. Thank you all very much for this experience, and uh, let me know what you think. Take care. Bye.